all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so the discussion last time we did about the spike protein from the vaccine versus the sars cov 2 and we also discussed that the vaccine based spike has a two proline lock on it which causes it to stay in a down position it to lock or pre fusion stabilized state although some percentage of these spikes do open up or bloom or go to the post fusion state but mostly they are pre fusion so then the question became if the and this was a cool bean who asked this question as well and that was that if the spike is locked in pre fusion state if the receptor binding domain and receptor binding motif are locked or in down position then how is the spike causing similar side effects in case of the vaccine injury for example as long covid so that is the discussion i'm going to go through various studies to demonstrate how this is an autoimmune disease which then causes antibodies to cause vascular disease it is not spike directly damaging the endothelium it is the antibodies causing thrombosis and endothelial damage and other damages so let's look at that together so first of all here are the references this is drbean.com in the description of this video there is a link to this one time fee to get access to another 900 premium medical lectures and this is not a recurrent fee this is a one time fee and that's about it and all new lectures that we are doing are also included how this can <laughs> this is the best gift ever that all 900 lectures are there plus there are more lectures coming in every week and they just become part of this without more fee anyway so that's that this is a diagram that is important to keep in our mind here is the spike protein the s1 unit is here the s2 unit is here and we'll discuss this a little more this is an important study that we'll look into this is the epitope classification and rbd binding properties of neutralizing antibodies against sars cov 2 variants of concern so we'll discuss this as well there is a diagram in this which i would like to go over this diagram and then there are some more uh, um, studies as well that i'll go over as we progress through the discussion so today's discussions take away is going to become how vaccine or sars cov 2 spike can trigger autoimmune disease the reason for having this discussion instead of simply saying you know what this is a spike protein disease and done the reason is this allows the providers and the physicians to manage their patients with a more focused thought for how to approach this pathology so let's start so the question is if vaccine generated spike do not bind to as2 then how do some people get vaccine injury that is similar to long covid or has the same spikeopathy now there are many questions within this question here and i have discussed them in my previous talk for example there can be vaccine spike generated injury both by sars cov 2 and by spike uh, from the vaccine i have discussed this that it is possible that one receptor binding domain is in up position or two i have also discussed that there is another locking mechanism called hexa pro that claim to be better than s2p because s2p seems to be more unstable so i've done those discussions i don't want to put time on them here is a question and here is my observation and i'm going to go over all of these points with studies so observation is 
that vaccine generated spike protein may not bind to ACE2 as intensely as expected or promoted. And the reason I'll show it to you. However, adjuvanted vaccine spike triggers neutralizing antibody production. This is a very important sentence. This is probably the whole backbone of the, the, the discussion. And that is when the vaccines are given, then we look for neutralizing antibodies. And the neutralizing antibodies mean that these are the antibodies on the parts of spike where when the actual virus is attacked, then the virus's spike protein cannot connect to ACE2 because the neutralizing antibody is hindering there. This is an important thing because if we have from a spike neutralizing antibodies, that will mean we have antibodies that are against receptor binding domain. That means for an antibody to be produced, it doesn't matter if the spike is locked or not. Okay, so I'll explain more a little later. So hold this thought. Then, continuing, according to the network hypothesis, Benil Jern, anti-idiotype antibody must be produced as well. This is a normal physiological function. I have discussed it many times. When our body makes an antibody, it makes, so that antibody is antibody, right? So it is against some antigen. Then our body makes another antibody against this antibody. So that antibody can be called anti-antibody. But in medical terms, we call it anti-idiotype antibody. I've done that discussion as well. I'll discuss that again today too. Then, some, so these anti-idiotype antibodies can bind with ACE2. This is another very important point. I'll show you studies for every point today. So think about it for a second, and we will look at it again later in the talk as well. You make an antibody against the receptor binding domain on the spike protein from the vaccine or from SARS-CoV-2. In the case of vaccine, we are claiming, we by, meaning medical community, that receptor binding domain is locked in the down position and in that position, it cannot bind with ACE2. However, that position is exposed enough for antibodies to be produced. So you make an antibody against receptor binding domain. Then you make another antibody against this antibody. So you mirrored the molecule spike, and then you mirrored it again. So mirror of the mirror is the original. That means you end up with an antibody that looks like RBD of the spike protein. That is the important part that antibody will bind with ACE2. So spikes, vaccine spike binds with it or not, with this ACE2. The anti-idiotype antibody will. And that is where autoimmunity come into play. All right, so last part. Hence, some of us will end up with autoimmune outcomes. It is clear that it's not that everyone develops thrombosis or myocarditis, but some of us do. Similarly, not everyone develops long COVID, and similarly, not everyone develops long-term vaccine injury, some of us. Just like some people develop allergies and others do not. And I have this discussion later as well. So here, once again, Imagine this is a spike protein produced by a vaccine. Could be virus as well. But I am focusing on the vaccine for a reason that I want to bring to physicians how to look at the autoimmune part of it. So imagine this is the spike protein. This is S1 part. S1 part 
has a receptor binding domain and an N terminal, which is fine. Receptor binding domain is the part of the spike protein that will bind with ACE2. However, if you see in this case, it is a lock here, which is called 2P lock. And because of that locking, this receptor binding domain does not go into an up position and does not become available to bind with ACE2. And I'm repeating this so that we are all again and again on the same page. Some percentage of this spike will bloom. So that would cause some RBDs to attach to ACE2. Okay, continuing. So then here is another interesting and important study. Vaccine spike has receptor bind binding domain in down position. I'm going to show it to you. The window switching is a little slow in this new setup, but anyways, so look at this one. I'm going to read from here. The RBD moves they're talking in the context of SARS-CoV-2, not in the context of spike protein of, from the vaccine, but the mechanisms are the same. The RBD, receptor binding domain, moves from a down conformation. Conformation simply means the shape. Where the ACE2 binding site is buried, ACE2 binding site is buried in the S tri trimer. And we discussed it last time that S1 unit of the spike is made up of three parts, so we call it a trimer. Two, an up conformation where the ACE2 binding site is solvent, accessible, and competent for cell surface ACE2 binding. Important thing here, you can leave all the words, except this that RBD has to appear in an up position to be able to bind with ACE2. This is like if you want to do a handshake, you have to move your hand and arm in a position where you can shake hands with another person. So imagine that position of moving hand and arm outside is called an up position. Now read this sentence. This is really important. Presumably, the down conformation of RBD hides the ACE2 binding site in the closed trimeric arrangement to at least partially protect the RBD, which is essential for virus cell attachment from the host's immune response. Right? So RBD in the down position does not bind with ACE2. That is a takeaway of this sentence. Again, they're talking in the context of SARS-CoV-2, but that is the same context for the spikes as well. I know that some of the viewers will be saying, well, this spike is never going to be outside. Hence, there is no question of binding to ACE2. It binds or not, that's a moot point. And I would demonstrate that that is an incorrect assumption. Spike can actually be outside. Now, before we continue, I want to do one more um, discussion of neutralizing antibodies. This part of the discussion will actually connect the dot to the spike injury or autoimmune issues and then how to manage them. So this is the second paragraph now, or the next paragraph. If you read here, they're talking about the neutralizing antibodies that are produced in response to a spike protein. And there are four types of antibodies, neutralizing all of them but four types. They call them classes. So if you read here, the C1 class, it is actually written in some literature as class 1. The C1 class is defined by neutralizing antibody that bind within the RBD ACE2 binding site. So if I go back to this diagram for a second, 
I should actually, I want to go back to my diagram. <laughs> so one second. If I go here, in this diagram, in this diagram, what they're saying is that there can be an antibody that actually directly binds with the RBD. And they would say one more thing, and that is that there would be some antibodies that might bind slightly sep away from RBD, then some more neutralizing antibody a little more away, and then some more that would be even more away. The point is they're all neutralizing. That means they hinder the spike's connectivity with ACE2, but some of them are directly on the RBD. This is the important point. So the one that is directly on the RBD is called class one. Then the second one that is slightly on a separate path or slightly on, on the side, uh, to class two. Then more side, class three. Then even more side, class four. They're all neutralizing. They all hinder the connectivity, but they keep going away from the RBD itself. So now if we go back, to the here. So if I quickly read it, the C1 class is defined by neutralizing antibodies that bind within the RBD ACE2. Essentially mimicking, this is important, essentially mimicking ACE2 binding. So if you make an antibody that binds to spike protein on RBD like ACE2 will bind, then that antibody can be called a mimic of the ACE2. But if you make a mirror image of this, this antibody, then you have made spike protein, specifically spikes RBD. And in last discussion, I discussed the epitope sizes as well, so I'm not going to discuss that here. So essentially mimicking ACE2. And thus, only bind to RBD when it is in the up conformation. Then if you see here, the C2 block the ACE2 binding site, yet can bind to RBD in its up or down position. Doesn't matter, the C2 can actually connect to it if the RBD is up or it is down. That means spike is open or not, that other neutralizing antibody can bind with it. Similarly, C3, class 3, bind largely outside the ACE2 binding site of the RBD in both up and down conformation, and C4 binds farther from the ACE2 binding site, and the epitope is only accessible once SARS-CoV-2 undergoes large conformational changes. So the spike has to change a lot to get that epitope open up for, for class 4. So if I now go here, starting from the A diagram, in the A, this whole thing, the ribbon purplish part is spike. The grayish greenish part, this blob here, this is the RBD in the up position. And this part here, the one at the top of A diagram, that is ACE2. So the RBD is standing up in the up position and binding with ACE2. In the diagram B, where they have this square, in here they are showing how various classes of antibodies attach to RBD. So the blue one is class 1, then there is class 2, that is, I believe, the purple one, green is class 3, and orange is class 4. For orange to bind with spike protein, the spike protein really has to bloom. And then, if you see here, on the C, what they are trying to prove here is that in the C diagram, the RBD is not in the up position. Instead, it is locked downwards. And because of that, this class 1 cannot bind with it. So if you were a molecular engineer, you will see that C1 is not binding. So we'll just take their word for it. And then in the D diagram, once again, they are showing other classes and where they may be attached. The takeaway from this diagram is that RBD 
even when it is hidden or when it is in the locked position, it still is accessible for the B cells and T cells to attach their receptors to it and to make antibodies or to have T cell receptor bind it. But that, that is not where the story fully ends. There is more. So let's continue. So I just read this one and I read this as well. Now the question becomes, if RBD is hidden, then how are the neutralizing antibodies produced? So that is the question, right? For a vaccine spike, RBD is locked down. Then how are the antibodies going to be produced? And here is the diagram. I used to make these diagrams of my own, but I thought this is an interesting one. Here, if you see, I'm going to walk you through this diagram. To The purpose of the diagram is not to see the immune system's function, but how spike protein from vaccine or SARS-CoV-2, here this is about vaccine, offer RBD for neutralization. So here is the vaccine. That vaccine has lipid nanoparticles. Those lipid nanoparticles, when injected in the muscle, they enter in the cell. Right here. When they enter in the cell, they release their ribosome, sorry, a messenger RNA that binds with the ribosome. Ribosome makes spike proteins. As I have done this discussion in the past many times, parts of the spike proteins will be shredded by the endosome and these will be loaded on the MSC1 or MSC2. Mostly the nucleated cells have MSC1. Here, this is important part. They're showing that when apoptosis of the cell occurs, so this cell is under stress. Why? Because it has a foreign material in it. That cell is not a happy cell. So it is saying, you know what, I'm going to die. Now this apoptosis can be triggered by the local natural killer cells. It can be triggered by the cytotoxic T cells, and it can be triggered by the cell's own internal defense mechanisms. The result is, the cell undergoes apoptosis. When the cell apoptosis, it opens up and spills the spikes that were inside. Those spikes, and I have done this discussion many, many times, those spikes will then be picked up by the local antigen-presenting cells like macrophages and dendritic cells. And those antigen-presenting cells will shred that spike into pieces, and those pieces will be presented on their surface. And of course, RBD can be presented, receptor binding motif can be presented, various other parts of the spike can be pre presented. So this is another mechanism. So spike itself, in fully intact, can allow the antibodies to form because the B and T cells can bind with it. Spike can be taken up by the local macrophages and, and dendritic cells and broken up and presented, and that can happen. Spike can be taken up by neutrophils, and they would burn it, and they can present the antigens. The spike can be broken up within the cell where it is forming, and those antigens can be presented. So there are many ways that spike and the hidden parts of the spike will be exposed to the immune system to develop neutralizing antibodies. For the discussion today, it is important that we understand that neutralizing antibodies will be developed. And the neutralizing antibodies are good guys, right? So they'll go and help. But when we'll make anti-antibodies against those, then the anti-idiotypical antibodies will become ACE binding antibodies. These will become spike surrogates. These are the ones that cause issue. But if we cannot make the neutralizing antibodies, then we cannot make the anti idiotypical antibodies for those ACE2s. Okay, so I hope this is clear. All the rest of this is just immune system activation, which is okay. Now, continuing. So that means, can we say 
that the vaccine's spike itself causes no issues. It is the antibodies. I think here we have to form an opinion. The reason for that, as I was lamenting in my last talk, that there are very few studies for vaccine injury. Actually, somebody commented under that video and said, here they are in, I believe, UCSF or Stanford, but somewhere near my house. <laughs> they're they are doing spike injury uh, studies. So really less studies. So it will be really great to actually have those studies to figure out how much of the spike is causing the damage. So the question is vaccine spike, does it cause any issues or not? I think there is going to be a part of vaccine spike that is going to bloom, that is going to escape, that is going to cause AS2 binding. And because spike itself is an antigen, it's not necessary that it has to bind with AS2 to cause a problem. Spike wherever present will cause inflammation and spike from wherever source, SARS-CoV-2 or vaccine. However, so if you see here, just the spike itself from SARS-CoV-2 or from vaccine, the spike can cause antibodies production that will become loaded on the mast cells and the mast cell can degranulate and cause mast cell activation syndrome or allergic reactions. Similarly, spike can bind with the antibodies and those antibodies can settle in various tissues. I've done this discussion many times. Those tissues can be blood vessel walls. Those tissues can be spleen, liver, kidney, joints, muscles. And wherever those antigen antibody complexes will uh, settle, over there, complement activation. So this little spaceship-like thing is a complement. Complement activation would occur local inflammation would occur, local tissue damage will occur, and the person would feel the consequences. Joint pain, muscle pain, uh, liver issues, or, or spleen issues, or renal issues, or endothelial issues, or clotting issues. These are all antibody generated as well. It is not necessary that spike has to go to every single tissue and bind with ACE2. So, spike's presence can cause inflammation too. Okay, so I hope that much is clear. So then we reach this point that fine, there is spike. Is that spike now locked? And so not really binding to a lot of ACE2s. We still see the ACE2 binding like issues along COVID like issues. What's going on? So now let's go to the network theory. What I did was Throughout the day today, I actually pulled together all of those theories and studies that were diversely present, and we had discussed them in the last two and a half years, and I have stitched them together. So this is a stitching lecture <laughs> which pulls them all together and connects the dots. So, so now let's bring in network hypothesis or Neil Jern's theory. What that theory is, and I've done this discussion, this is a study by Dr. William Murphy and Longo. And Dr. William Murphy has appeared on this channel many times to discuss this study. This study is when he say, said that they found anti-idiotypical antibodies in patients of severe SARS-CoV-2 and in those who developed long COVID had these antibodies as well. Do you know how we know what these antibodies are? These are anti-ACE2 antibodies. So here he's gotten a diagram which, which shows that we have the antigen spike. We make antibodies against that. Let's call it antibody one. Then we make antibody against that antibody. That is the Neil Jern's theory or network hypothesis. And that anti-antibody or anti-idiotypical antibody goes and causes ACE2 to be triggered. Let me show you that study.
So if I go here, this is that study. A possible role for anti-EDO type antibodies in SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination. January 27, 2022, I actually discussed it in detail with the cool beans over here. Then we invited Dr. Bill Murphy as well, and we discussed this with him as well. Now there is an update to this, and I would like us to look at that as well. This is the update. This was on March 3. What is this update? In this update, there are a couple of researchers, a doctor as well, who responded to Dr. Bill Murphy and Longo's work. And they said to the editor, Murphy and Longo, so I, I'm not going to read everything, but here they are saying that, hey, there was this study where Dr. Murphy and Longo mentioned the anti idiotype antibodies causing, causing myocarditis, immune mediated thrombosis, and thrombocytopenia. And please, be aware that here they did not just talk about SARS-CoV-2. They said anti-idiotype antibodies in SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination because the mechanism is going to be the same. The offending agent is the same, spike. Yes, the shape is slightly different, but you can actually see that even if that spike directly doesn't bind with S2 or binds with less uh, percentage, even then anti-idiotypical antibodies will provide the same path we will make our own spike, those antibodies. So this letter, they're saying that, hey, they mentioned myocarditis, thrombosis, and thrombocytopenia. However, this doctor is saying that we know that SARS-CoV-2 can actually bind with neuropelene 1 as well. So they're saying there are more anti-idiotypical antibodies other than just for the ACE2. And they said, in our practice, over the past three months, I have cared for five patients who have had post-vaccine serious adverse events involving the peripheral nerves. Four of the patients had severe peripheral neuropathy with sensory perception deficits and pain in the limbs. Two patients had palsy with partial recovery after 12 and 8 months. One patient had persistent tinnitus, approximately 50 decibel 500 hertz in both ears. All five cases occurred within 24 to 36 hours after the first dose of Pfizer-BioNTech. So the point this doctor is making is that it's not just anti-ACE2 antibodies. There could be more, like, for example, neuropelene. The possibility that anti-idiotype antibodies or other immune-mediated mechanisms targeting neuropelene 1 may be involved in vaccine-related complications, including neurological sequelae, should be considered during clinical evaluations and investigate to improve the current vaccines. Then, here is another. They are researchers who said that we were the first one to talk about anti-idiotypical antibodies for SARS-CoV-2 and vaccines. And not only we talked about it, we proved it. So here they're saying we wrote, so this is a second group of researchers. They're saying we wrote, it is likely that there are, these are anti-idiotypical antibodies and issues regarding the response to SARS-CoV-2 and potentially be explained using Jern's network theory of the immune system. We showed that the measurable levels of angiotensin-converting enzyme antibodies that Murphy and Longo speculated may exist are present in 81% of the patients who have recovered from COVID-19 and are not present in patients who have not been infected. Murphy and Longo proposed that anti-idiotype responses may affect ACE2 function, leading to the induction of inflammatory cytokines. We showed that patients with ACE2 antibodies have reduced ACE2 activity and wrote, this provides a potential mechanism for alteration of the balance of angiotensin peptides, leading to increased angiotensin 2 and activation of the immune system. So I have done that discussion many times. Then they say, to our knowledge, we were the first to propose and test this hypothesis. <laughs> so they're saying, well, we, we did it. And then Dr. Murphy and Longo re reply and they say, we agree that to the first doctor, Dr. Maria, we agree that anything the spike protein can bind can therefore also be target for mirroring anti-idiotype antibodies and may affect cellular function. They said, sure, neuropelene would be involved too. Then to the other researchers, Dr. Murphy and Longo said, 
Harville and Arthur point out that their study published in September 2021 showed the presence of anti-idiotype antibodies to ACE2 in patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Our article was submitted months before their study was published and we were thus unaware of it. They're saying, well, we actually published, uh, submitted that first. Then they talk further. However, whether similar anti-idiotype responses and effects occur after SARS-CoV-2 vaccination still need to be determined. Since the release of our commentary, we have received correspondence from both patients and clinicians describing evidence of potential anti autoantibodies to ACE2 in association with protracted adverse events after vaccination. Then they say, much more attention to these adverse effects of infection and vaccination as well as an understanding of the immunologic mechanism underlying them is needed. You see how important this discussion is? Okay, so let me just show you these next two. So then the question will become, I hope that I am going through point by point. So let's say that we have reached this far that we understand that even when the spike is locked in the RBD state for the vaccine, it can still create neutralizing antibodies. It actually does. We are all <laughs> the researchers and everyone is happy that, well, it makes neutralizing antibodies. We also know that these antibodies wane, but they make it. And if the neutralizing antibodies are made, then we are also seeing that that also means there will be anti Eriotype antibodies, which will bind to ACE2 and create the whole spec spectrum of the pathology that we expect from the spike, plus more because antibodies have biological functions like complement fixation and activating the other cells, binding with the natural killer cells, uh, binding with the uh, uh, mast cells, and so on. Okay, so continuing. So that means the antibodies, these anti idiotype antibodies, can bind with ACE2 and do everything which I just spoke. And I have just reviewed these studies. So then, if anti idiotype antibodies are physiological, this is an important point to keep in mind that these antibodies and the anti-antibodies are physiological function, meaning a normal function. It's actually a homeostatic function. If they are physiological and homeostatic, then why do people have chronic issues? So here comes the next set of studies that have to prove that chronic issues can occur or not. So I'm going to show you those. So I have two sets of studies here, or two studies. This is one study that shows, and I remember I discussed this, SARS-CoV-2 infection induces long-lived bone marrow plasma cell in humans. I remember when this study came out, I spoke about this as well, and this study caused a lot of ripples in the pond because people use this study to say, look, the infection produces durable response. I would venture that the similar response will occur from vaccine as well or should occur from vaccine as well. But now we are going to this point that if somebody has the injury from vaccine or SARS-CoV-2, most of us will get injured. So for example, please don't take this message out of context. For example, when I get the vaccine, I will get locally injured for some time and then that will be finished. Similarly, most of us will get SARS-CoV-2, will become injured by it and then will recover. However, some people will then become a little longer sick for a longer time. Intensities are different, disabilities are different, different and their uh, outcomes are different. So here, this study says that when B cells that produce antibodies are formed, some of those B cells, I've done this discussion in the past, those B cells will live, the memory B cells, will live 
where they encountered the offending agent. Some of the, them will live in the local lymph nodes. Some of them will start circulating in the tissue fluids and the blood circulation. And then in some cases, some of these memory B cells will go and seed the bone marrow and live there. If they become living in the bone marrow, many of such B cells living in bone marrow are called long living or long lasting plasma blasts. LLPB. Not necessarily every B cell that comes to bone marrow will become long lasting, but A category will become long lasting. They will provide immunity for long. So now think about it for a second. If we have a bad cell, bad cell making anti idiotype antibody that is connecting with ACE2, and that cell goes into the bone marrow and starts living there, then instead of providing protection for long, this cell is now going to protect, provide disease for long. But there is a study that is counter to this as well, and I want to show you that too. So here is a study, not for the vaccine, but for the, for the infection. Now the second study that I want to show you is this one. This is COVID-19 and plasma cells. Plasma cells are active B cells, right? The ones that are making antibodies. COVID-19 and plasma cells, is there long-lived protection? And in this study, they actually went over the protection by SARS-CoV-2 or by vaccine. And their conclusion was that there is no long-living protection from either of them. So let me quickly show you that as well. So this was the bone marrow, and this is the one. COVID-19 and plasma cells is their long-lived protection. Man, I have I studied all these studies today, today to connect them together. So that's a Thanksgiving gift. <laughs> so here. In this discussion, I want to read a couple of sentences that are very interesting. They said, memory cells and durable antibody protection from long-lived plasma cells are the mainstay of most effective vaccines. And I also want to actually show you one more study. That is this study. So when was this? This was 7 January 2021. In this study, and all of these links are in the description as well. In this study, they said that if you give someone the spike protein alone, that doesn't cause so much of the antibody production as much as when you give adjuvants with it. So they say we evaluated three different clinically tested adjuvant systems in combination with the SARS-CoV-2 pre-fusion stabilized spike protein. And their finding was, it's the adjuvant that is kicking the immune system and triggering it. Okay, so now if I go back here, this study says the purpose of the vaccines is to try to make B cells that would go and live in the bone marrow and be longer lasting. but then they go over this discussion and they say there are some vaccines that fail to produce plasma cells that can go in the bone marrow and live there for longer. And they say COVID is one such case. I actually like this. You might be saying, well, this is totally wrong. They should be able to see the long-lived plasma cells in the bone marrow because people are hurting for longer time. They actually discussed that somewhere down <laughs> near the end here. They actually discussed that in this area. If you see here, the acquired humor, how sick is this that I actually remember where is what? The acquired humoral immunity re rapidly waning within four to six months after completing two doses and and post-boosters 
is inconsistent with LLPC being generated and maintained. So they're saying that even when we are giving these boosters, they are still not producing enough long living plasma cells. But then they also talk a little later to say it may be because we are not observing the bone marrow for long enough. So the end part of this discussion is anti-idiotypical antibodies are formed. These can cause pathologies. In majority of the people, either from SARS-CoV-2 or from the vaccine, these all the antibodies will be taken away and will become normal. In a subset, these cells will become long-living. And I have now shown you both studies. One study claiming that there are cells that will become long-living after the infection, and the other study saying we have seen no long-living B cells after infection or the vaccine. And I said I like that. Why I like that is if there is no long-living B cell after the vaccine, then there is a hope that the vaccine injured will continue to become better as the cells wane away. And they have four to six months or more as the waning time. And I think it depends upon how much the cells will be were produced. For example, they talked about the study that I had discussed in the past as well, that they saw that in the vaccinated individuals, the local lymph nodes were making the, the um, antibodies even four months after because there were traces of the messenger RNA or uh, vaccine producing system. So they mentioned that in here as well. And they say it's a matter of time. There have not been sufficient studies to keep observing this the bone marrow for longer time. But it will actually be good if a year, year and a half later, these things go away. But I know there are patients who have been suffering for more than that time as well. Wrapping up this whole discussion, Thank you very much for your time, 647. Wrapping up the whole discussion, the point is, this is an autoimmune disease that has all the symptoms and signs of a spike pathology because it is coming, this disease is occurring because of anti-idiotypical antibodies. I'm not saying that the spike itself may not be causing spike present anywhere or any foreign antigen present anywhere in the tissue will cause local inflammation because our immune system is not going to forgive that thing to be present there regardless of it binding with ACE2 or not but in case of SARS-CoV-2 and the vaccine spike the double whammy is that not only there is an offending agent against which our system is making inflamm inflammatory responses, but that agent spike protein can bind with ACE2 and create further pathologies. So in the case of vaccine, even if that spike doesn't bind, anti-idiotype antibodies can still cause further pathologies. That will mean, to bring the point home, physicians, nurses, NPs, PAs, you will have to figure out how to manage this autoimmune aspect before you continue to hunt for the spike itself. I've seen so many patients reaching out and saying, where is the spike being produced? Where is the mRNA in the lymph nodes? Where is this, the, the virus sitting? So if you think about the anti-idiotypical antibodies, you will have a better way of managing the patient. This actually explains why for a longer period of time this issue occurs and fortunately because they are not finding any long living plasma cells this in my opinion this is opinion so i could be wrong these pathologies will not become 10 year 20 year 30 year long pathologies these pathologies would go away we have to support the patient my request to the physicians is start managing and suppressing the immune system's behavior so that tissue damage doesn't occur while you are trying to get the immune system back in the normal state. That is a discussion. I hope it makes sense. Um, if you have any questions, we can do a chit chat afterwards. Otherwise, I hope that we are good.
Jesse says, I really, really hope you're correct, doctor. Me too. Uh, this part, <laughs> Skyfrog says, thank you for your hard work. So, so uh, Skyfrog, the, the effort today was, I knew all those studies separately. Many of them I've discussed. Effort was to pull various sentences and mechanisms and stitch them together in a story that we can understand how this whole thing works. Um, so thank you very much for this. And going back to the J Jesse, so me too. Good news in this whole discussion, they're not seeing long living plasma cells. So even the bad plasma cells making anti idiotypase twos will not be there. Second good news in the, di the discussion is just like the actual antibodies wane, the neutralizing the good guy antibodies, they wane. Similarly, the bad guy antibodies will wane as well. So we have to give time. Plus, during that time, we have to protect our patient from not getting the tissue damages. That is what is important. Okay, so with this, if you would like to continue this discussion, we can do that in a chit chat. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow. Um, but please do me a favor. Old school says, thank you so much, Dr. Mubin. Uh, Dr. Mubin, perfect timing for me. I see my primary by the morning. I can't really share this with her. But there are so many studies in here. They're all published, accepted, reviewed studies. They're not some fringe studies. You should be able to share those studies and say, hey, look at these. Okay, so please like, subscribe, and share. That is the little favor you can do for me. Nowadays, as the videos have become hidden in live tab, the, <laughs> the viewership is just gone because people cannot find where these are. So your liking, subscribing, sharing, some commenting would actually help. And if you would like to support this work as well, then you can buy me a coffee or you can use PayPal to support me or you can become a patron or you can become a YouTube member. You can also, in the description, there is a link. You can buy Dr. Bean's plan as well, which is a very reasonably priced product. So with this, I will, I will wait for a few minutes after hanging up to see if you want to do a chit chat. If you do want to, then I'll come back. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye for now.